All right. Well, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to those who are online. My name is Brad DiCiano. I am a rehabilitation physician. Um, and in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, I am the director of the UPMC Adult Spina Bifida Clinic. So I see the folks who transition over from the pediatric side to the adult side. And I'm also the medical director for our Center for Assistive Technology, where we see children and adults uh, for assistive technologies like communication devices, wheelchairs, and other um, types of assistive technologies. And today I'm going to talk about some research and technology development that we've done um, to aid in transition and self-management. And just a couple of disclosures to start. Um, the technology that, that I'll be describing today has had federal funding from several uh, federal organizations and also foundations. Uh, I'm also going to talk about a technology called I'm Here, which we invented and was licensed by UPMC. So today we're going to focus on mobile health. And why is mobile health potentially helpful for those undergoing transition? So first is that mobile health is scalable. Um, it allows our programs to reach larger populations. It also allows us to personalize our care to individuals so we can use precision and tailoring of our interventions. And because people carry their phones with them everywhere they go, they can receive those interventions anytime, any place. We all know that Oftentimes we forget our phones and we'll go back home to get our phone sometimes when we forget it because it's so important to us. And there's a large and ever growing population whose smartphone is their only connection to the internet. There are lots of people out there who do not have computers and everything they do is on their smartphone. And so when we think about patient care, we have to think about it through the lens of our patients who are using different technologies and making sure that um, what we're providing to them digitally is accessible through the means that they use. So we've developed uh, some mobile health applications. It's called the Interactive Mobile Health and Rehabilitation System, or I'm here. We have an app that's for the patient, and we have an app for the caregiver. Um, and these right now, if you they are on the app stores uh, for both Android and iOS, but if you download them, they won't work unless you register them. And right now we have them um, designated for special programs, but we are looking for lots of partners to work with. And I'll talk a little bit about um, how we're using them in practice. So this image will show you how the system works. So one of the main users is, like I said, the patient. The patient uses an app. The app can be on a smartphone or a tablet. The app can also link with other devices like activity monitors or scales, for example, and everything that the patient does on the app, the data flows into a secure cloud that's HIPAA compliant. <clears throat> There's also, like I said, an interface for the caregiver. The caregiver could be a family member um, or a caregiver could be a professional caregiver like an attending care worker. And the app that supports the caregiver provides an interface for the caregiver to help the patient, but also provide support for the caregiver themselves. And then there's an interface, which is a web-based portal that is appropriate for someone who's monitoring a whole group of people. So you may think of that as a clinician, like a nurse case manager, a service worker, um, or even people at community-based organizations. We have um, some partnerships with some community-based organizations who do uh, work with care coordination and service coordination, and we've built interfaces for them. And so this is all very modifiable, and um, we can change the layout um, to suit almost any sort of care model. So to give you a little bit of uh, background in terms of what the app itself does, so this is the patient app. And it has 25 plug and play modules. So all the little squares that you see there all perform different functions. And you can put them in or take them out and you can do that at any time. And you really just need to give the patient the modules that are appropriate for them. So if they need help with medication management, you give them the medication module. If they need a personal health record, you can insert that one or educational material or apps to help you do certain self-management skills. 
So you, it can learn and adapt to you over time. So as you learn certain self-management skills, maybe you don't need that module anymore and you can take it out and you can add new ones. So this allows us to support people as they grow and become more independent with some of their self-care. So I'll walk through just briefly, we don't have time to go through all the modules, but I'll, I'll give you a sense of how some of the features work. Um, one is the education library. We have a vast uh, education material library that really can be customized. You can deliver different bundles to patients depending on their conditions and their interests. There's a module that helps with medication management. They can create a list of their medications. This list can be changed by the caregiver or the clinician and updated, and the uh, patient can receive reminders to take their medications on schedule, and they can customize how those uh, reminders will be delivered. The nutrition module is based on the concept of my plate and food portions to give them a sense of uh, what dietary intake they should be having and when they're under or over those re requirements. There's a way that we can collect patient reported outcomes. So you saw this morning about how it's really important to assess things like depressive symptoms or quality of life or transition readiness. So we can deliver that um, to patients' phones and, uh, and survey them and um, use that data to help guide their care. They can receive reminders to do certain self-care activities. So my patients, for example, self-catheterize their bladder and have to do that on schedule. Um, so we can deliver reminders um, when they're due to do those activities. And then they can also tell us whether they completed them or if they encountered problems. So if they're experiencing a symptom like a UTI or they're running out of their supplies, they can let us know. There's also a module to support goal setting. This allows the patient to create goals and track how well they're doing with those goals and also get feedback from their caregivers and clinicians about how they're doing. A module to support daily living needs allows them to create a checklist of all the things that they need to do throughout the day, like bathe or dress or do their homework or whatever it might be. And then they can assign those tasks to caregivers. So the caregiver then can see what tasks they need to help the person with and keep track of what needs to be done. And this is, this is especially helpful when we're trying to teach um, young adults to become more independent and also uh, guide and be the manager of their own care. Um, and so especially for those folks who work with professional caregivers, they be can become more um, directive in what care they need. A module allows them to um, keep track of what physical activity they might participate in. And we have a lot of information about adaptive exercises for wheelchair users and people with disabilities. The skincare modules, um, quite robust. We have a lot of patients who experience pressure injuries of the skin. Um, so this app allows you to report a wound. You can show us where on the body the wound is, take a photo of it, upload it, and include information about the wound, like its size and whether there's drainage. Um, and then that allows us to track the wound over time to see if it's responding to treatment. Whenever a patient submits data that may indicate a problem, like a wound, for example, the, patient, the portal that is monitored by the clinician will um, receive an alert and the portal will allow the clinician to triage all the problems coming in from all of their patients so that they can address those things quickly. So uh, the clinician on this side would see an alert that one of their patients submitted a wound photo and then the clinician can act on it and send messages back to the patient to give them instructions on what to do. There's lots of other features as well um, that aren't um, specific modules. They're just features of the app itself. So like I said, patients can get reminders and notifications for certain tasks. They can schedule them and see them in different ways. Um, they can receive positive feedback from their caregivers and, and care managers. And there's also a points or rewards based system that you can use to encourage them. And then they can customize the app um, with more features as they earn points. We've also made the app fully accessible for people with different types of disabilities. So if they have dexterity problems or visual problems or cognitive issues, there's lots of accessibility settings that can allow you to customize the app in different ways to make it more uh, accessible to use. 
there's a secure messaging system. There is a store and forward technology, which means if they lose service, um, none of the data is lost and it will synchronize when they get back in service. And like I said, it's adaptive and you can deliver different bundles. So we could have bundles for patients with spina bifida, bundles for patients with cystic fibrosis or transplant and deliver different features based on their conditions or age or needs. And there's centralized monitoring. So as the clinician or the care manager who's monitoring a whole cohort of patients, we create a dashboard and you can customize the dashboard so that you can see the alerts in different ways. This allows you to triage the information coming in and really make it useful for patient care. You can slice and dice the data pretty much any way you want and also get reports that help you see um, what your uh, patients are doing at a population level. We've done a lot of research with these this system. Um, these are just some of the papers that we've published, and I just wanted to highlight a couple of findings from some of our research. Um, so far, we've enrolled more than 250 people in our studies. The people have had lots of different disabilities and chronic conditions. Our participants have been children all the way up to older adults, and our participants have also been professionals and support personnel in different fields as well as caregivers. And our studies are designed as focus groups, usability and accessibility studies, feasibility studies, and we also do formal and laboratory testing. And I wanna talk briefly about two small pilot randomized controlled trials that we did in spina bifida and spinal cord injury. So we had, we randomized patients to receive either usual care in our clinics or usual care plus use of the app and we enrolled people for a year. And we found a positive outcomes from using the app compared to just getting usual care. Participants were most likely to use the bowel program module, the medication management module. They also used the photo um, feature, the messaging and the surveys quite often, the photos especially more often than we anticipated. And the more the people used the system, the more their self-management skills grew. So we actually measured self-management skill and what they were learning. And those who used it more seemed to learn more skills. We also looked at preventable conditions um, and the control group um, pretty much stayed even in terms of uh, the amount of preventable conditions that we were seeing. But in those using the app, we had friends and even a significant reduction in UTIs in our patient population, but trends in all the other important outcomes that we were looking for. So a lot of folks ask us, well, what about integration with the electronic health record? Well, here, fortunately at UPMC, we have a system called Self. I don't know if folks are familiar with that. So already integrated into Epicare, is a system that allows you to deliver and prescribe digital technologies to your patients. So you can prescribe educational material, you can prescribe videos, decision support tools, and even apps. And right now the library isn't huge um, for what's available, but we all have the opportunity to create the materials um, that we can deliver to our patients. And so we've integrated I'm here into Zell <clears throat> so that we can digitally prescribe it to our patients now. And I'm starting to do this in my clinic. So the workflow for this is that when you open <clears throat> a patient's encounter, um, you can just prescribe the app just like you can prescribe a medication. And then the patient will receive an alert on their phone. They'll consent and download the app and it'll be linked to their chart. And then that allows us to monitor um, the, what they're doing with the app right from their chart. So this is an interface that shows you how you would order it. These are just some bundles that we've created of digital content for our patients. We have digital content for a lot of different areas, and the app is one of those things. When we order it, we can actually choose which features we would order. <clears throat> so this is just a fake patient. But you can see here that we have a variety of different modules that we can deliver to that patient. So I've chosen a couple of them to deliver on the first prescription. And then that will flow over to the patient. They'll download it. And then this is what part of the dashboard that I might see in their chart as they're using it. So I can see the medications that they're missing, uh, the medications that they're taking, the most common exercise that they're engaged in, how many minutes of exercise they're engaged in and then um, some information about nutrition. And we can really 
customize this dashboard depending on what the clinician wants to see. So that's just a brief overview of uh, the capabilities that we have with our mobile technology. Um, I've included a QR code if folks are interested in learning more. And I think we'll have questions later um, after the second session. We'll have time to answer some questions. Thanks, Marks. All right, wonderful. There we go. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Julia Pantel, and I'm one of the internal medicine and pediatric residents here at UPMC. Um, I guess technically it's the first day of my PGY3 year, so now I have moved up a year. Um, and today I'll be talking about how social media helps adolescents in their process of transitioning. Great. So soon after the internet became widespread, social media was created as a way to form communication and connections online. So it's not a surprise that our young people migrated to social media as platforms for them to share ideas, opinions, and beyond. And so in a recent research study from the Pew Institute, 95% of young people said that they both had access to a smartphone, but also use social media at really high rates. And what's even more interesting is that these, this use of social media and also the access to smartphones seems to be very consistent across socioeconomic and racial and ethnicity groups. Um, now, more than ever, young people are consuming social media like never before. Nearly half of teens say that they are on their smartphones or on social media almost constantly. And when we try to estimate that, we're getting about five to nine hours a day online. So certainly a significant part of the day. The top sites that they're using, they're using YouTube, they're using Instagram, they're using TikTok, and they're using Snapchat. Adolescents have used these apps to find connections with their peers. They're using it to gain information and they're using it to advocate about the issues that matter most to them. These are all key topics for our teens and adolescents as they're transitioning into adult world. So this begs the question for our talk today, how can we use social media or how does social media already support young people as they are going through this transition process from childhood to adulthood? So as I kind of mentioned, social media allows for a lot of key um, domains that are important to our young people. It allows for social connectedness. It allows for education on key matters that are important to them. And it also allows for awareness and advocacy, especially for our young people who have chronic medical conditions or medical conditions that their peers might not know about. So today we'll talk about these three domains and we'll use real world examples for how social media is supporting our young people today as they go through this process. So first, social connectedness. So an example, Tony is a young person. He has muscular dystrophy. He can't walk as he once could, but he maintains the mobility and dexterity of his hands. So he uses social media often to connect both with people who have muscular dystrophy like himself, but then also his friends and peers who might not have that. He uses Facebook forums. He also uses online gaming to step into worlds that unites all of these people together. And through gaming, he's able to have fun, play games. He's able to chat with his friends. He's able to walk into the shoes of his video game character. And in this, he has become like an expert um, at all of the games he plays. He beats every other player he meets. And so this use of social media highlights several key aspects of how social connectivity is so important on these apps and what it can do for young people. For young people, but especially young people with chronic medical conditions, social media provides an avenue for peer support, a place to find others far and wide who have shared experiences, and a place to foster collective identity building. You know, at this age, teens are working on doing things themselves. They're trying to be individuals. They're separating from their support systems of childhood. There are also increased stressors. There are social conflicts. 
There's increased mental health concerns. There's a lot to navigate. And social media is one avenue in which teens can come together to move from isolation to connection. You know, it's for the teen who's in the LGBTQ plus community, who's finding others online just like themselves. It's the young person with cystic fibrosis who wants to meet people, um, but has limitations on seeing people in person because of the concern for sharing respiratory bugs. It's for an adolescent with a rare disease who finds their cohort on a Facebook group and has long and long conversations with people far and wide. So social media is tapping into these key factors, the key factors that help motivate adolescents at this age, how they relate to their peers and how they engage with others of the same age. So moving on to education. According to a new uh, recent New York Times article, sites like TikTok and YouTube are becoming the new search engines for Gen Z, our generation right now who's going through this transition process. So for one example from the article, it was a 15 year old who wanted to learn how to um, ask her teacher to write a letter of recommendation on her behalf. She was trying to go into a new high school. So she turned to TikTok, she searched letter of recommendation and on there she found um, a example from another user on how the specific words for how to ask her teacher, but then also a sample letter of recommendation for her to know what that even means and what that looks like. So adolescents are turning to social media to look for all types of things like this, you know, health tips, style tips, education tips. We can even try it ourselves. I tried it. I went onto TikTok, you search type one diabetes, and you get tons of videos of young people that are showing others how to like put on their continuous glucose monitorings and how to take it off, what it means. If you go onto Instagram, if you type reproductive health, you see tons of content that extends from issues on consent to menstrual health. And so through the social media, people are creating a database of shared knowledge. They're modeling behaviors for each other and they're sharing techniques and tips for their peers. But even more than that, there are experts during the conversation too. This is my personal favorite example. It's from 2020. The Johns Hopkins School of Public Health dropped, I think, one of their best social media campaigns to date. It was called Wear a Mask, Please, or WAMP, which was a parody of the original Cardi B song of a similar title. They gained thousands and thousands of views. They received many shout outs from celebrities. And using this, they were demystifying COVID. They were demystifying other public health issues at the time. They use memes, they use videos, and they use tons of other pop culture references to try and uh, dispel myths that are online. And these are some other notable recent examples uh, from the Met Gala. And then also we have some Star Wars out there too. So this is just one example of how experts are leveraging the communication style of adolescents to promote scientifically sound information online. We live in a healthcare system crippled by systemic inequities of who can easily access medical information and medical care, and social media may be the equalizer. Because it is so pervasive, the knowledge shared on these platforms has the ability to reach those who may be systematically disadvantaged from receiving information and care afforded to their more advantaged peers. Okay. Moving on to advocacy and awareness. So Ryan is a 25 year old, he has cystic fibrosis and he posts on social media every day, TikTok, Instagram and alike. He almost exclusively posts about his disease and he often takes his videos while he's doing his breathing treatments. And that includes his chest vests and his nebulizers. And in this way, he's trying to promote awareness about these breathing treatments and his other medicines and why they're so important for his health. As an advocate, he is using social media to help educate the world on how young people with cystic fibrosis are different, but also alike to their peers. So advocacy is this online. It's you know one single person, one influencer trying to promote awareness, but it's also nonprofits like Sickle Cells and other advocacy groups who are raising the voices of many. So I certainly would be about a a miss without mentioning some of the pitfalls of social media. And there are a lot that is a whole other topic. Um, social media is created by companies. They have bottom lines. There is marketing and corporate interest embedded into the apps. There are algorithms that dictate what young people consume. Endless scrolling keeps teens locked onto these apps for hours. Certainly emotional contagion spreads. Negative ideas are selectively perp uh, perpetuated. 
Most of these posts are from individuals, and so the information on them is mostly anecdotal and firsthand experiences. This does allow for incorrect medical advice to easily go viral. Even more, there certainly are privacy concerns and safety concerns, um, and negative comments can lead to worsening mental health concerns and also negative self perceptions out there for young people. So we don't really know how social media will change in the future, how regulations or how broader societal changes will, you know, um, revolutionize the platforms. But even so, social media is certainly not going anywhere. And so the best we can do is help adolescents by joining them, joining these platforms and conversations and promoting safe use of these products. So in conclusion, our young people are getting key things related to the transition process from social media platforms, how to connect with people, how to educate themselves, and how to advocate for themselves, but also for things that, they, that matter most to them. So how can we support them as providers, as patients, as members of the multidisciplinary team? We'll look to one example from the Got Transitions group. They have a, a hashtag out there that's called Healthcare Transition. Um, and they have a whole tool toolkit on their website for how to use social media um, to specifically promote healthcare transitions. So these are two examples. This first one was meant to be a Facebook post that you can share, but you could share it on any platform. The second one is a meme um, trying to play at the humor that is often in social media. And they also have tons of sample tweets about, you know, why do you want to transition to adult care? You know, repost, share your thoughts. All in together. This shows how we can join this conversation and create content that helps young people thrive in this transition process. We can all do it. All it takes is an idea, an account, and you are ready to go. And that is it. Thank you so much. And now I think we can have any um, questions or comments from the audience, either in person or online. Just a minute here, we have chatter, right? So, what we would like to ask the question, uh, uh, Julie, you know, one thing that comes up all the time is about misinformation and uh, uh, false information online. And it, it, it just like I would like some general thoughts on that. And also, what is the, you know, the responsibility of these social media companies to censor that in the context of free speech? Yeah. I mean, certainly a very important question and a certainly, I think, a very complex topic, too, that we as a society are still trying to grapple with. Um, you know, I think I myself personally am in favor of, um, for instance, what Twitter did a few years ago in which when uh, someone is posting a news article, if you yourself have not clicked on that news article and actually read it, you're not allowed to repost it. So those types of, you know, stops, um, certainly try to encourage people to share news that they've at least read. You know, it's not saying that that news article is true or false, because certainly all opinions I think are are valid, um, but at least forces or forces a, a pause in the cycle that allows for just, you know, endless thoughts to perpetuate forever. Um, that's certainly one example. I think, uh, young people are certainly at risk of running with, you know, the, the clickbait and the headlines that promote that. Um, so it would certainly be a concern that um, we as a healthcare system, if we're thinking about a big social media campaign, would have to certainly reconcile, reconcile with. Um, but I also think that if we're able to put more positive information out there, you know, eventually the positive information and the hopefully correct medical information will outweigh the negative information. Oh, sorry about that. That was in response to um, uh, the kind of misinformation available online on social media and what is like our responsibility to address that or how should companies also have responsibility to address that.
I have questions about the event. Um, I'll start with the social media. Pardon. So I don't know if there's a perfect answer for this, but there's a challenge of having them. I mean, we need for them to improve their social skills and transitioning so they can advocate for themselves. And so I find that my teams are doing this exclusively. And so it's so important in the, in the um, in our appointments to have the parents leave after a while and talk to them so they practice. So I, I guess I would like any of uh, your recommendations for how to do that because it's um it, it's so hard sometimes to get them to talk and they're losing those skills. If they can click, they're fine, but when they have to work in somebody and say, I don't want to be on this bed because it makes me itch, they can't do that. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, I, I certainly share that experience as a provider who sees kids and often has to kick parents out of the room. Oh, yes, sorry. Uh, so the question was um, that often young people, um, you know, social learning how to communicate is so important in this age. Um, and so there comes a time when you have to kick families out of the room and really try and talk one on one with the young people. Um, but oftentimes it's, kind of like pulling nails and it can be hard to really engage when the, their communication style is so used to chatting online. So what are maybe strategies to um, kind of work in that space? Um, I would say, you know, certainly knowing how they're interacting online, I think is the most important step in trying to use that um, to your benefit. Um, and um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, certainly continuing trying to engage with kids, you know, relating to them in whatever ways you can, even if it's learning about, oh, okay, well, what are you talking to your friend online? Um, and other ways to kind of include them in a one-on-one -on -one personal conversation. Yeah. Like a question on there too. Um, so the next question in the audience is how are social media platform sites usable for people with IDD, such as monitored and mediated spaces, mediated spaces? Um, yes, a uh, really awesome question that I actually don't know too much about. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else. I think because because of the nature of Facebook and Facebook groups, I know that there are monitored Facebook groups for certain conditions um, that some are patient centered, some are um, some are linked to clinics, some are not, some work independently, but there are sometimes some qualifications that you have to show to in order to be invited or allowed in the group, some are closed. So there are some that are sort of developed to be um, specific for certain conditions. Right, if I can ask a question. Sorry, I apologize if you have already addressed that uh, this is our scope of what you guys are talking about. But we, when you talk about leveraging technology to make transitions and, and I, I think about from a provider standpoint and the EMR. Now the EMR right now is it's becoming a building tool, and it's not not really uh, not really aiding us that much in taking care of patients. Do you foresee some tools that can be built into that, which can? Uh, I, I'm sure there are already the tons of ideas. Could you could you just address that? So there, <clears throat> the question was about the electronic medical record, <clears throat> and are there tools that allow us to use the the record? in a more beneficial way to aid in transition. And so I showed a, a, a new system that we have here at UPMC that's also available a lot of other institutions that is called Zelf. Um, and it integrates with the electronic medical record and allows you to prescribe digital content to your patients and also monitor how they're using that digital content. So you can prescribe videos, um, decision support tools, uh, smartphone applications, simple educational material, um, and that way the, the information can be delivered right to the patient's phone. And then you can see, you know, whether the patient viewed it, how much, 
Um, and then you can also get more sophisticated by creating dashboards. Um, and so I think that these types of functionalities are becoming more popular, especially as people start using wearable devices. So you'll see these um, start incorporating physical activity monitoring and, and other devices that people are using. Brad, I will talk to you about this afterwards, but I'm, congratulations on all that incredible work through your program. Um, I can see that applying very nicely to my patients, and we'll need to talk about that. My question is about the monitoring. So I, I looked at that and thought, okay, how would I implement that if you give me uh, the right modules for my patients, like our, our mean group, so to speak? And then I'm thinking about monitoring that and then trying to get our transplant coordinators to be alerted for those messages. And I'm just wondering about the burden of that and how I get buy in my team. Um, I'm all about it, but I'm only one person. Yeah. So do that. Yeah. So the question is about uh, when you're using tools that generate a lot of data and a lot of communications, how do you manage that? Um, because it can become overwhelming. And the, the amount of data that we, we can collect is astronomical and more than what a, a single person can monitor. So I think you can, you can solve that in a couple different ways. Um, one is by um, being sophisticated and crunching the data in a way that you can present it to a clinician in a very digested format. So you, you show snapshots, you summarize the data and show them exactly what they want at point of care. So you can, you can set up systems so that you're really looking at their data um, at the frequency that you want and when you want. Um, another thing that we can do is change and change our, our billing practices. There are um, opportunities to bill and there are billing codes for patient monitoring. And I think you know, as clinicians, that's a way that we can carve out more time to be able to do those kinds of things. And then um, third, I think integrating things with the electronic record as much as possible. There's tons of systems out there and apps and things that you can use, but clinicians say that the more things you have to log into, the less likely they're, they're to do it. So the more that you can integrate it into their actual workflow, um, I think also, also helps. I mean, you, you should have it, but can you get into the portal and see? So the... The, the patient, um, the, the, our app will link to the portal in the sense that they can download the app by getting a message through the portal. Um, but right, we, we would love eventually to integrate it with the MyUPMC app as well. But right now they're two separate, it's two separate apps. Okay, so you can what I what my experience is, and I, I'm sure others can chime in, still, that the concept of transition is a very sort of a subjective topic. It's a process. Unlike the rehab uh, utilization of these uh, mobile apps, as far as rehab uh, area that it's a very good objective data. The transition concept is so subjective. So, how do you actually, like, you can administer those uh, stitching modules? But what we did is, it is like a lot of patients with syndromes and a lot of patients with intellectual disabilities, then like we stay spectrum. So, at the end of the day, still, like, I'm still, how we achieve that somebody is like transition ready. Obviously, we will make some progress, but how do you monitor or track a, sub, a topic which is very subjective in nature and uh, So the question is that the transition is a process and it looks different in different conditions. Um, and it may be even more challenging in certain populations like folks who have intellectual disabilities. And so how do you leverage technology in those kinds of populations? I think first the transition readiness assessment that Beverly presented is, is, a, is a fantastic tool. It really helps you plan out um, what the patient themselves can do, what they'll be able to learn and what they'll always need support with. 
And so then that can help you plan out who is the actual user of the technology. Is the, is the technology user the patient? Is the technology user the caregiver? In some cases, um, we need more robust tools for the caregivers who are actually doing, um, a, you know, a handling a lot more of the transition process in those patients who may need more support and may not be able to become independent ultimately. So I think you really need systems that support the whole team. You know, there's there there. It's important to support the patient, but you really need roles and access for all the different people who are supporting the person at the center of the care. What, what we have done is in our program, we actually by chart, there is a standardized transition readiness assessment for patients with genetic heart disease. We send them the questionnaire, they fill it out, and like uh, our nurse coordinator like, looks at and that, and it does sort of the topics which we should be addressing during that work count. Mm -hmm. Then we revisit that transition readiness as a like, questionnaire again after two years and see what their school was mm -hmm. uh, And we haven't, we have found some progress, but there are like, it has done, it hasn't been that dramatic of a progress because the concept is very subjective. Mm -hmm. So the, the comment was using the transition readiness assessment, um, integrating it into the workflow and actually using the data to sort of guide some of the discussions during outpatient care and, and looking for changes in that assessment. And I think that's a wise way to do it is, you know, that's goes back to like, you can collect a lot of data, but if you're using it point of care to really drive your practice when you're in the visit with the patient, looking at it, discussing it, that's a good use of the data to use it efficiently. We've also found it helpful to look at the mismatch between the, clin the, the parents uh, filling out of the transition readiness assessment and the patient, because what you'll see is mismatches between what the patient thinks that they can do and what the parent thinks the child can do. And sometimes you can discuss those mismatches in the scores and it really helps you figure out uh, there's a misunderstanding here about what the child is going to be capable of doing. Um, sometimes the parent thinks the child can do less than what they actually can do. And sometimes the child thinks they can do more. And so that, that really helps sort of plan where the interventions need to, need to be done for both the parent and the, the child. Okay. I think that's the track of the TRM view. And so those answers, what I'm worried about with that, and it's a validating great tool that there's a lot of studies on it. But what I worry about with that tool is they answer it the way you want them to. So, yes. so there's the right answer, there's the wrong answer. So I worry about transparency. And then when you say you're not you're not seeing differences, it depends on the interventions in that period. And then it also depends on how they're maturing too, because they would need those questions different. And so the answer. You know, we have we have a question that uh, um, a questionnaire they want us to use about it says, uh, uh, "Do you do you worry that your that you'll have uh, that your kidneys will get sick?" Well, some kids go first of all, it's a kidney. When you had a liver test, like they may not hear it, but then most patients go, "Well, no," but because they don't understand about oxygen and clear issues, so. So it isn't that they don't worry, they don't worry because they don't know. And so how can you discriminate that when you have a questionnaire? And that type of a questionnaire where they're just on with the on track and you strongly agree, strongly disagree, I believe, or I think it's one where I don't need any help with this, I need some help with this. So yeah. um, you don't know why they don't know. So. Yeah, so just for those online, there was some discussion in the room about how to use some of these assessments. You know, we have to kind of probe at the why they're answering the questions the way that they are, <clears throat> and also realize that sometimes they're they're answering the question in a way that they think we want them to answer as clinicians, um, and we want to encourage them to really answer honestly and not try to please us with their answers so that we get the most accurate information. I have a question for you, actually, Julia. Um, 
I, I think it's really fascinating. It's something that we don't think about a lot that patients are using social media as their search engine instead of Google. We're all, all those of us who are older just go to Google and other search engines. But um, how do you have any recommendations for us who work in certain areas like spina bifida or transplant or congenital heart medicine? Um, how we can advise our patients to search those apps most effectively and, and sort of teach them to really get the information that we think would be most helpful. No, that's a, a really wonderful question. And I think um, certainly uh, if young people are finding a certain like site or referent or, you know, a video that really sticks out to them, I would encourage them to bring that up with their provider and say, hey, look, I saw this um, on YouTube. What do you think about this? Um, certainly there's a lot of videos out there. They're consuming a lot. And so that's not going to be possible with every little thing that comes up. But I would say if it's something that certainly sticks out um, to them, that would be a, a good thing I would encourage. Um, or even including it in some of these conversations or toolkits as we're thinking about the transition process. Um, you know, what have you seen online? What have you seen on social media about, you know, the complications of diabetes as you're getting older? Um, what are questions you have about those? How can I help answer those questions? I think that would be a really interesting thing of, of starting to be proactive about um, seeking what our young people are actually seeing. Yeah. yeah. So if I try to download this app, you have invented. So uh, uh, then what happens next? We have to sign up. Like if I ask my patient to sign, uh, like download this, and then can you give me some practical tips? Yeah. So the question was, um, look, at the app that I presented today. Um, how can we get it to be functional for certain patients? Um, contact me, um, because if we want to use it in certain clinics, we have to set up the workflow through Epic and so forth. So, um, I can help you, help you set that up offline. All right. All right. I think that's all the questions. Thanks everybody.